मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग सर हेलो मॉर्निंग Uh, sir, we are waiting for the uh, panelists, right? They are joining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you? Sir, I am Prabhjot. Yeah, hi. Yeah, they should be joining. Okay. हेलो हेलो ऑडिबल राइट आई विल टेस्ट द वीडियो आल्सो वंस या मैम ऑल राइट या इट्स विजिबल ओके अम सो आई टर्न इट ऑफ टिल फर्स्ट टाइम एज इट इज माय टर्न एंड डोंट वरी आई नॉट टेक टू मच टाइम टुडे ओके
Good morning, Jim. Uh, good morning, buddy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. You're audible. You're audible. Yeah. yeah. Let me see why the oh, volume is low. Okay, fine. Right. Now it is fine. So, yeah. sir, I think uh, we should start okay. the program, right? Yes. yes have yes. all the resources. Okay. So I will start. Then I will give it to you. G. So a very good morning uh, to all the respected dignitaries, uh, esteemed panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of National Institute of Disaster Management, I extend you all a very warm welcome on this webinar, Importance of 3D Cultural Heritage Documentation in Disaster Management. I take this opportunity to welcome and introduce the patron of this webinar, Sri Rajendran Ratnu, Executive Director, National Institute of Disaster Management. Sri Rajendra Ratnu uh, is an IAS Joint Civil Services in uh, 2001, and uh, he has uh, also coordinated various flood relief programs uh, in the state of Tamil Nadu, initiated communi uh, community kitchen uh, as a pilot project, and his concept has now been mainstreamed into the common flood management program. He has recently joined the National Institute of Disaster Management as an executive director. I would also like to introduce the convener of this webinar, uh, Professor Santosh Kumar, who is the faculty and head of Governance and Inclusive Disaster Risk Reduction Division. And being a disaster risk reduction policy planning and capacity development expert, he has more than 35 years of experience. And he has he in, in different positions in development planning and DRR. He holds a, a PhD in economics and also studied gender and development in IDS Sussex UK. Uh, last, I would all, uh, like to invite architect N. Ramalingam, Design Chair, School of Architecture. He is currently the professor and advisor uh, of CARE School of Architecture. He has uh, also held various uh, positions as an head and the professor uh, for uh, for various universities uh, in the arch in the architect department, I will uh, I would also like to uh, welcome him. Welcome, sir. And uh, now I would like to uh, request uh, architect Manya Rasan Rajendran, associate professor, Care School of Architecture, to give the program briefing and the objectives of this uh, webinar. Over to you, sir. Sir, you are on mute. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Mr. Singh, and uh, thanks to NIDM for the, organizing these training modules every month. And it, I'm very glad to see this disaster because what we, what used to be once here and there, we end up unfortunately seeing it day in and day out nowadays. The recent one being Turkey and Syria. I think we uh, NIDM plays an enormous role, an imminent and a mandatory role in our context where we have uh, volatility in all all possible senses, whether it's natural or man-made, or in terms of like things like earthquake or floods, like like things happen here in Trichy a couple of years ago where the canals were full and then the floods were happening and then they, they, we, used, we lost a lot of cultural heritage monuments. Uh, over here, and uh, as as an institute, uh, Care School has been working on uh, documenting and assessing, and uh, doing urban design interventions on the Kaveri Delta region in Tamil Nadu. We have, uh, the focus is completely on that part. So here, uh, I'd, I'd like to first also thank uh, Dr. Kailash Rao sir, who who has been like very uh, openly accepted it without even questioning anything. And, and, and so thankful for that, sir. Thank you, Ms. Sonam, for uh, being a part of the host as well. And also I thank specifically Vivek, who has been like persistently been behind to ensuring that things are, are running on track. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Ramalingam, sir, is a little, uh, I think uh, I think he'll join us. So I'll, I'll just want to uh, 
kind of start with a little brief in terms of uh, uh, like a small short presentation on uh, what, what is the status of our like developing regions like what exactly where exactly do we stand in 3d documentation because the entire world is running away with it whereas we are still uh, bothered about uh, CAD drawings and uh, the most we have reached is probably Revit uh, in three-dimensional things. Like the, the kind of potential and possibilities that three-dimensional uh, building information, a building information modeling can give uh, is, is enormous. Whereas in one side, we are, uh, we are developed much more in, there are many more companies that are coming in VR and uh, augmentation and gaming environments, whereas in conservation and heritage, and disaster risking management, like we, we are still in the basic uh, level of it. Uh, I, I think that potential is has to catch up and uh, just to uh, run through it, like uh, can I share? Uh, I think my, my sharing is not uh, enabled. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, It has some issues uh, I may have to close and then come back again because it's asking for open system. So I, I, I think I'll, I'll just run through, just it's just a brief thing I would like to talk about uh, in terms of uh, uh, how it, important it is to develop these kind of 3D documentation frameworks uh, for the developing regions like us, like because uh, there are three things in terms of what what status are we in right now in the current requirement with India, uh, and then the kind of approaches that we can take as individuals as well as uh, uh, small firms or larger institutions, and look ahead with the inferences over here. Because with Indian context, we do talk about a lot of troubles in terms of data, the different culture, the archaic guidelines, and the most most kind of an intent kind of ends up uh, mostly like romanticized or picturesque points of view. Uh, and also in terms of the fundings and deadlines kind of doesn't really help the 3D thing. Uh, the 3D documentation still has some kind of a path to reach, but then these kind of hurdles kind of keeps pushing us back. And the other is, thing is also that we really don't have a, a centralized guideline to professionals who really want to do it on their own. Uh, apart from the institutional point of view, I, I, I feel the localized heritage committees also have a lot of important role to play uh, in this. So within this, uh, what, what do 3D technologies can do uh, to, to heritage, to rather to stop uh, disaster risk management? Is something is a question that uh, I think everyone needs to find our own answers to get, uh, alone as well as together. Uh, and then why, why are we actually rep, uh, presenting the representation or rather the documentation or, or an image or a model uh, is because unconsciously we don't realize that the documentation is the one that actually directs or concedes the direction to enlightening us with what we have. Because when you're talking about the 3D data uh, we are talking about real time information we are talking about what what is there in front of us in our environment and that has been a problem uh, when we don't have that so that is where we need to look at understanding the imaging possibilities the 3d three dimensional documentation in terms of laser scanning in terms of photogrammetry whether even uh, in mixed with remote sensing and gis uh, I think that can give an enormous amount of data and with a good amount of training with students and uh, with the cultural heritage sectors planning with the institutions in terms of these kind of training. Like I, I, I think this is a very good starting point uh, with NIDM and uh, where uh, the other heritage sectors could also be catching up uh, by doing these smaller training portals, which could lead to bigger workshops, bigger uh, even even the digital heritage 
degrees could come into india because we we still we are still talking about conservation we are not even got uh, we have gone into any department of conservation but whereas digital heritage has become a common normal uh, departments across the world uh, and other universities so we ask like uh, like someone like kailash rao sir who is a pioneer in 3d documentation i am i i can i can very open i can say that i i am actually following the kind of things that he has been doing so what we are doing in the sense that we are using imaging as a tool not just to document but to analyze investigate assess unconditional map uh, with what we have you need to we can utilize the three dimensional information the beam modeling or the three dimensional models to uh, process or utilize every every part at every junction we can utilize to use this data and we also understand the kind of importance an image can carry an image or an imaging model can carry that in and specifically when it concerned with history and the other important point is that the 3d modeling is they makes the process reversible at any point of time or any point of practice the the data that we have is the makes makes a process completely reversible and to understand that the imaging product uh, process is a continuous one and not necessarily that it's a one time posterity thing it it can't be that so it the the documentation part has to become a seamless normalized practice uh, in whether in cultural heritage or in disaster management or in conditional assessment or in any other sector that deals with uh, cultural assets uh, heritage assets needs to look in so just to simply to put in i think the 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 most key important thing that we need is to develop uh, a guideline set or a manual set that can enable seamless capture that is the data capture whether it's laser scanning or photo scanning or gis or mapping and then seamless processing and kind of appropriating the outputs to the point where how do we archive them and how are we able to retrieve them i think this is where i would give uh, the context of uh, the three dimensional documentation that is there specific to the indian uh, region so uh, i'd like to open the thing uh, to the presentations of uh, professor kailash sir sir and uh, ms sonam gupta so i'd like to uh, i think uh, so uh, if you're there if uh, kailash sir sir yes yes i am there but i'm not able to share button is uh, i'm not enabled yet you're not able to hear me i can hear share button is not enabled i suppose Oh, okay. oh no, no, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'd like to present like uh, Dr. Kailash Rao sir. Uh, he runs pretty long, so I'd like to keep it short. Uh, Dr. Kailash Rao sir is a, a head of conservation department in SK Vijayawada. Uh, I, for whatever I know, he is he is the pioneer in three-dimensional documentation in India, at least in India. The kind of amazing works, intensive. Uh, intricate and most developing work that he's been working on uh, he's been uh, and i think as an institution he has ensured to procure the state of art facilities including laser scanner currently and uh, I, i i the kind of results that we get to see is kind of completely breathtaking and also uh, in terms of the data that we have it makes the job uh, much easier for the people who are actually assessing on top of it so he has a phd uh, from manipal institute and currently heading the uh, sp vijayawada college and he is also a member from national monuments authority he has been heading he has been an honorary member in a lot of uh, important government and non government organizations uh, yes sir professor kaila sir thank you <clears throat> thank you mani for that you know brief uh, wonderful introduction <clears throat> okay let me Uh, I, uh, the, the most of the participants are from the background of uh, disaster management and related aspects. Is there? Okay, fine. So let me just uh, share the screen. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, does it? You're sharing screen now. Okay. Uh, is uh, is my screen uh, visible? 
yes your okay. screen is visible sir you can see the webex web ah now you can see the presentation yes okay okay because i i'm not able to see okay fine whatever sometimes you know it's there on the small little at the corner i know what i'm speaking but anyway it's fine now uh, well um, i just uh, have to tell that the kind of a uh, intricacy that we have in um, you know documenting indian uh, context is quite different from the western context i would say uh this is uh, mostly i um, you know those who are from the architecture field know that <clears throat> this has been one of the primary reference material to do with the you know uh, uh, architectural understanding of history so the minus sir banister fletcher's book you can see that um, lots of drawings of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, buildings in the western context you know huge amount of documentation will be seen there is also a little uh, approach wise these buildings are based on uh what do you call um, i would say uh, drawing based whereas when you see this kind of buildings they don't seems to be purely a drawing based kind of an approach um the kind of an architecture especially the temple architecture extremely complex because the plans are different at different levels there's nothing like you cannot look at from the perspective of plans or elevations or section uh and also but at the same time you can see that the way Uh, such a complex geometry this is a you know 28 sided uh, star shaped building uh, in a place called uh, udeshwar in madhya pradesh sometimes in early 11th century this was uh, built uh, by paramaras the same thing you can see that you know i mean within 50 years span you can see in uh, similar kind of structure uh, depicted in other places of uh, you know very non descript places like the uh, 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 haveri in karnataka uh, you see this the idea is replicated and uh, in a small miniature now to to give a scale of what is this miniature you can see this uh, just kept a bottle to give you an idea what kind of a scale that we are looking at it uh, what i'm trying uh, or maybe you know one of those mahadev uh, temple of uh, khajuraho you can see a similar uh, idea spreading into the down south you know northern karnataka part but uh, in a small place called tiluvalli you know i mean most of it might not have been heard about such places so this is the kind of a translation of these ideas happen so that documentation if you really have to look at it in terms of a western perspective to draw it i would not really be able to convey it because it's you know if i cut a plan here is different it's a plan here is different you know plan is different every level it is different there is a different approach together but in terms of accuracy very high degree of accuracy to tell you the level of accuracy there is no mortar you will see between a stone to stone in the sense like there is no plaster under that one normally if you have any small little mistakes you can cover it with plaster you know when I mean, that kind of thing whereas there is very cut to size every size every stone is cut to size and this thing so not only they are building it they are also communicating across the time and space you know i mean same ideas you can see that to various places you can see that one so some of this kind of a temple that i did and around um, you know 10 12 years back uh, of course those were the different types of it in terms of w story kind of ones orthogonal types star shaped um, uh, temples stellar configuration which we call it a place called dambala dadabasappa or some of the structures are subterranean some of those you know uh, wells uh, uh, you know and some of the wells are like you know conceived in the form of a temple and an unwrapping of the temple of course you can see the kind of a condition more grown and you know people using like dust pits so this is the kind of a rich heritage that we have but in terms of a understanding part of it uh, well sometimes this two dimensional approach may not be sufficient because uh, for example uh, the challenges of uh, documenting these kind of uh, temples is as is various condition it's not like you know making a very pretty drawing of it but you know you know in terms of a uh, how it has been done, done you know i mean how uh, with this thing uh, sometimes they are very accurate as you can see here at like you know very very sharp edges that means everything is very precisely worked out but then my initial understanding of whatever that uh, teaching that i had for documentation at the most we were using cat as a digital digitization or digital was that that is the most uh, the kind of a thing but then there are a lot of limitations here also we were trying to be very accurate because you cannot uh, this is the one of the temple in um, talakad kirtinarayan temple the whole uh, uh, you know what do you call vimana had collapsed at certain point of a time uh, during a certain 
uh, you know, uh, removing the sand. This whole building was under the sand. So it was to do the plan, you know, uh, to, to do the condition assessment, we really had to do very detailed drawings because to know how white has collapsed, what happened, what is this assessment and other things. So at that point of time, for in terms of plan, yes, we used to be very, very meticulous to put very, uh, uh, you know, uh, reference lines. I'll show some of the drawing, and then you do that kind of thing. There's no two things are same here. There are a lot of variations are there. But when it comes to the other aspect of it, well, uh, it was very difficult to document in uh, elevations. This may look very, very interesting, pretty, very nice looking drawing, but then we realize that. It is we are assuming as it is straight and doing it and just mapping the information of it. I mean, in the sense, like okay, maybe for example, what is the level here? Point zero two six five is there? Point how much is the point level here? Because otherwise, every line that it is, if it is a crooked line, if you have to draw it like that, it is impossible. You know, that's it. So many challenges are there. At the most, we used to do this kind of a assessment of condition. Okay, where there is a uh, you know, I mean, uh, there is a collapsed areas. There are areas which are to be uh, which are damp and other kind of things. So mapping could have been done. So though it might look very interesting as a drawing, but I know that it is not a real representation. Because if I really have to document it, this is the number of drawings that you know lines that you will see in a temple actually. Because it is if I really put it in a wire mesh frame, if I just look at it, that is a level of complex geometry that I actually see. So even manual documentations of such kind of a buildings is very tricky. If you, if you are just doing it as a two dimensional uh, drawing, assuming everything is straight line, it is fine. But uh, you never know because if you really look at, if I have to understand this, how much is this building is tilted, you know, I really have to put a plumb line and to, you know, take a measurement from, you know, from here to here and then only I can see how much is tilted. Now, out of which I really have to, I don't know whether it was intentionally done or over a period of time, the vagaries of nature has. Uh, made it like tilted like that, or is it the loads which are acting on it, or some sort of a foundation which has sunk in, or a soil has sunk in. So to to understand all these kind of a things, the accuracy levels have to be very high. Sometimes I'll tell you, it may take a you know I mean this is the kind of a detailed uh, drawings that we used to do. So for many people, documentation means just acquiring a drawing of a you know plan elevation section. But when we did the conservation, uh, it. It is very important to know how much of each of this one is important. The reason I am telling you it is important for us because a column might tilt, you know, let's say 10 degrees or 15 degrees, you know, I mean, uh, because of some various, various reasons uh, in a traditional building. But uh, it is a one degree which may make difference to fall or stand. You know, some of them may look as precarious as this thing, but it might have really taken five and 200 years to 300 years to tilt that much. But one more little variation of as you know uh, of the cg it may collapse so that is the reason we need to have a very accurate level of drawings to assess it okay so that is a thing so these were the kind of a thing but unfortunately most of our earlier drawings are either too schematic like this or some of them which were done in during the time of a uh, british period or too cryptic at times they are in terms of a text based or sometimes over uh, simplified from the mandalas kind of a thing i'm not telling that they are not important they are very important but for a a detailed understanding, one needs to understand what is the configuration, what genre it is. So this is the you know part of our uh, overall understanding of various uh, types, typologies, uh, their distribution across north and south, what are the, st the stylistic aspects of it, what are the genres that there are variations and other kind of thing. And it's uh, adding to that the terminologies is very, very dis you know, difficult, especially in Sanskrit or local languages. From place to place, it's, it varies. So various kind of a challenges that we have. And just putting in a nutshell, what all challenges that we have in terms of it, documenting these things. First and foremost is these are not. They seem they don't seem to be like your orthographic drawings based kind of a thing. They seems to be based upon a certain kind of a other understanding, based upon text, based upon genre, based upon style, based upon. And the craftsmanship, uh, uh, their distribution, and it have been ever evolving. They have never been a standard, uh, what do you call, a stag stagnated approaches uh, in terms of they have they have been ever evolving right from the third century uh, BCE to you know I mean perhaps uh, a very prolific activity up to uh, 11th, 12th century before. Uh, you know, the other the invasions came, you know, and then after that also you can see that in a southern part of it, you have a lot of 
activities happening during the Vijayanagara period and uh, various uh, kind of things. So these are the types of it. And then, uh, as I also told you, they are a, a, a complex jigsaw puzzle if you really do not understand what they are. Uh, because, for instance, uh, you know, if I really look at the small, you know, at a plinth level, which is Jagati level, if you want to see, the variations are very tiny. These are the gaps which are not, how do you call it, um, unintentional. They are intentional. They are there is a there is a method of madness in doing that one. And and these are the kind of a. This is the last one. So and also, uh, as I told you, there are no two uh, things are. Huh? Oh, okay. Sorry, it was some. So, uh, no post tools are same. It's unlike your brickwork, you know, you can uh, shape the wall based upon the geometry of it. Whereas here it is not. One, this particular stone has to fit in only one particular place. This you cannot replace like a, you know, one, you know, what you can use like a brick at a lower level, same brick can be used at an upper level of wall. It is quite complex kind of a thing. So, I mean, my area of work has been, uh, of course, how do we really complex uh, these geometries to understand, especially in, in understanding in three dimensionality. Earlier, we didn't have any major photogrammetric uh, uh, software. This is around maybe uh, eight, 30 years, 25 years back, uh, 20, yeah, 22 years back kind of the work. So somewhere we used to take the pictures, stretch them based upon the original dimension. Okay, suppose if you take a picture with the, the camera, there is a little, you know, I mean, barrel distortion or some sort of a height will not be the same. You know, exactly. It is as it goes for the height reduces. So it is a three dimensional image on a two dimensional this thing. So you stretch them, adjust them in a CAD correlate with this your overall plans and other things and try to at most do this kind of a model set at three dimensional ones then so that is where uh, uh, the, the this kind of a uh, question started coming into us that uh, whether you can ever document these kind of a complex buildings in two dimensional in totality we realize that it is not impossible because one is they are very complex three-dimensional objects where the plans keep changing, elevations keep, you know, I mean, if I really have to convert it into drawings, they are this thing. And also these things like plans, elevation sections are the modern communication tools of a few new buildings, not the exact understanding tools of those things. Because they're never based upon, seems to be, they never seems to be based upon plans and elevation sections. So our own documentation techniques for a basic understanding, it's fine. For conservation efforts, no. And it is also very important to do this kind of detailed documentation of these buildings, especially from the perspective of your disaster management part of it. Uh, well, like let's say what is happening in the places like, you know, uh, uh, Turkey or some other places, if at all uh, the kind of losses that you have to be assess what is, you know, um, heritage buildings, uh, uh, mere basic drawings will not be helpful because there are already some thousands of years old buildings. There's already certain kind of a, you know, uh, distortions or various, uh, these things occur. When you want to, if you, if at all, if you want to reconstruct or restore it, you should know what the original geometry is all, what the original condition was in totality. This, this is the kind of a thing. And, uh, well, there, this is where we came across the kind of a, uh, various applications that were there. And moreover, you went to do that, uh, one, one, documentation needs to happen for six months huge amount of field work and then transmission loss from the field to when you try to convert it into a drawing there used to be a lot of transmission losses also used to happen because how accurate is accurate maybe I say centimeter is accurate or millimeter accurate or what is that accuracy and second even how do you you know uh, uh, what do you call uh, account for this uh, actual variation that happens in the buildings otherwise also so these are the things which were kind of a matters of uh, concern for us so then there are two things one is the size of the object other one is the complexity of the object if it is very complex in terms of let's say you have to make something you now one lakh or you know 10 lakh measurements in a, a, a you know a 10 meters uh, size then you need something like this terrestrial photogrammetry or a laser scanning or something 
or suppose the scale is large and the complexity is okay small let's say 10 meters then you can do different measurements this is the kind of a thing so kind of a, we have tried out most of the things different places different applications are there okay so perhaps uh, uh, tachometric uh, uh, things which are basically trying to uh, you know understand the surface from one point to the other point with rest, rest you know and then recreating it a pipe cloud is one of the aspect which we came across this is around 2009 10 that is the technology which was available and i had to do it for one of this uh, project which was a uh, uh, archaeological site very important archaeological site i'll try to show what we have done so that was the time then we also tried out um, uh, 9 10 certain photogrammetry at that point of time the softwares were not that advanced we literally grew with them so you really have to you know uh, first is to uh, calibrate your uh, you know system and camera with the targets and then uh, you know fix the targets at a different locations of it and you know maybe you have a, a, a certain kind of a different photographs to be taken of course it wasn't that easy in those days so i mean we had to fabricate some sort of a ladders and other kind of a thing climb up and 10 times and take some pictures you know I mean, so these were the kind of things because you need a lot of after you know jerry uh, charts in those days it was uh, different kind of thing and this is the kind of a very complicated site that we have our classical site but how do you really document where something is pulverized something is half standing some of them may collapse at any point of time so these were the kind of a things that we were doing after doing so much of it we were only used to get some you know 3000 <laughs> 4000 that is the kind of resolutions that we had in those days you know both in terms of our cameras or both in terms of our computing capabilities or in terms of software kind of thing so so that's the kind of thing i mean maybe with a great difficulty we used to get a little bit of a meshes of this category low resolutional polygonal meshes and then everything had to be literally you know i mean though it's a computer thing you should do but then you really have to do it so at the most okay fine we used to get some sort of a data at least which is complete in three dimensional this is an classical kind of a context that we were trying to do and um, of course much more useful because at that point of time the the, the kind of a uh, problem was the, these people were doing is you know take the stone arrange it in one place and see whether it fits or not here we have a you know a kind of a situation where you have a information available and three dimensionally without even disturbing the original you can cross check whether it is this piece is actually goes there or not that where is that so we also tried certain kind of a, another uh, you know slightly uh, much more detailed versions of it using a white light scanners or uh, certain kind of a other uh, of course this was uh, 50 meters range uh, lidar that we were using at that point of time for the full site maybe around 27 sites uh, 27 uh, scans and we that was a kind of a great achievement for those days i mean this is around uh, 10 years, uh, not 10 years, around yeah, 12 years back, 2010. Uh, this is the kind of a uh, data that we were acquiring. Good enough, but we had an idea about what technologies can be done. And then when there were not many, uh, uh, I mean, that's always a thing that when uh, the project is uh, over, I had no access to the software, you know, neither the systems nor to the equipment. So then we also tried some kind of a basic, uh, you know, what you call Jugard techniques, you can say that is basically, you, you know, use some Xboxes. Uh, infrared uh, using xbox gaming stations for a uh, infrared scanning kind of a thing the whole idea was to understand this in totality well certain level of resolution was helpful and we could manage it and then with the uh, as software started grow growing up we started growing with them and these were the kind of uh, little detailed information we started getting it creating a sparse clouds to the you know dense clouds sometimes open source software sometimes uh, you know uh, other kind of a softwares which were uh, you know which were available and then there's a race between software and hardware never ended so we had a kind of a thing so uh, uh, but then what was really important was that uh, for example uh, you started gathering the information in totality like you know I mean, whatever that is there at a different levels of it you can access the information of whatever the resolution that you want. If you want a plan at a certain level or a plan at another level, you can gather, you know, different, different kind of, a, uh, you know, information that we started getting it in terms of it, uh, uh, details. 
Well, um, of course, I never had any very specifically one software or two software as a loyalty. We used to keep changing it, whichever was useful to get that particular level of it. And resolutions also, whichever was at a different uh, need based approaches. Suppose if you want a very accurate information at a micro level, go for the LIDAR and uh, then if you want a reasonably okay, then use photogrammetric applications and other thing. But then these were all pre-grown areas. We are, you can clearly see that we didn't have much of the information at an upper level. So well, uh, of course, uh, reasonably good enough to cross check with the various verification at the side. Good enough for a you know, 3D printable level data. I mean, sometimes you know you never know what you see on a screen, but your you know screens are Maya and Max and other kind of things. You don't know make believe things. So whether it's a 3D or 2 d also we don't know. So. Well, some kind of a, uh, you know, a cross checking whether we have information in that. This was a paper based, uh, you know, 3D printing that were done. So, at a micro level information, and also more than anything, we were trying to understand the logic how they have been built. At different types of a columns using similar kind of a section, perhaps uh, we started recreating the original geometry, perhaps, you know, that is the kind of a thing that we were trying to do. Then, then it started with the whole new facets of it that you know the complex approaches what this craftsman were doing you know to create this kind of a three-dimensional element whether it's a column whether it is a, a, a sort of a part of a wall or a, every course of geometry or you know I mean, uh, you know plinth then we realize that all these things are uh, they are smart enough to you know communicate just with a few. Uh, small uh, segmental drawings they were trying to manage it. So, I mean, uh, then of course, uh, the major application at the point of time to see that, you know, how much of computational understanding these guys had. So, well, that was quite useful to, you know, decipher some of those very micro level of, uh, you know, detailing that has gone in creating these kind of buildings, whether it is a, you know, at a very small level of detail to a larger level of detail. Of course, I have not touching upon the sculptural aspects of it and other kind of thing. So to, to a greater extent, we could really look at, you know, a, a very complex ones that their generative logic uh, in terms of, uh, you know, con uh, converting uh, or perhaps, you know, maybe while reconstructing using uh, certain kind of uh, sections or certain kind of profiles, uh, to some extent, we could uh, decipher them, you know, how uh, these craftsmen were thinking. Uh, from you know subtle variations uh, with subtle variation they can create a different different types of a structural this thing of course a lot of uh, 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 what do you call a core understanding or domain knowledge about these uh, 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 structures was important to you know uh, to do this kind of a thing and then uh, trying to interpret them in various uh, you know condition various uh, contexts started looking at this architectural understanding. Uh, this is not drawn a building, these are all generated buildings. So we can say that they, most of this geometrically, they were all generative in nature. So this was the thing that we were trying to look at it. I mean, whether it is even very complicated temple like looking like this, which is a you know 28 sided star shaped building. Uh, once we scanned it and then what could have been its original one, we could decipher it with certain kind of a, uh, how uh, those, uh, uh, what do you call uh, variations that they tried from one accentuation, you know, from one level to other level, what uh, fraction they were using to attain a certain kind of a straightforward line, you know, that was what we could really gather from these things. And well, finally, uh, realize that there is a certain kind of a mathematics that they are using, they're using a heavy a level of, I wouldn't call it an algorithm. It may sound like a 21st century is a proprietary one, but they were using a lot of computing understanding because to assemble this many number of stones, to draw them, to cut them, to put them in the right place, you need a large no, an amount of you know computing understanding. If they are not using computers, but they were they are not new to computing. So otherwise, such a complex geometries couldn't have been achieved. Okay, so these are the things. And then uh, well, then, uh, then of course, uh, uh, with the advent of uh, drones, uh, sometimes um, around eight years back, uh, we kind of uh, uh, getting a little bit more insight into these things. Uh, the, the earlier geometries that we could never decipher, uh, the roof plans of it, 
we could really get it uh, you know uh, much more accurately how the conceptualization has happened in these cases i think i mean what kind of a geometries how they they conceive these things were becoming much more clearer so uh, even such a complex uh, kind of a you know um, you know uh, well which is done like a temple we knew what baselines they were using and how they were trying to do it so that uh, that of course uh, then of course once you have this kind of interesting uh, gadgets toys <laughs> or whatever it is i mean our own uh, interest increased and started capturing more and more uh, these things and uh, we were getting excited about uh, how these things were done, uh, how they must have been built. I would not uh, use the word decoding, but something very close to it, like, you know, which we could never have achieved in this kind of a, without using this kind of a orthographic, uh, you know, information. And uh, once this whole information uh, comes into on you know, desktop, the details of analysis can be much more, not only in terms of uh, its geometry, not only in terms of its uh, configuration, but its condition as, as assessment and, you know, how, how much is broken. I know every little uh, deflection of the wall, the little cracks on that one, all those kind of things were much more easier. Otherwise, with the normal level, we wouldn't have been able to uh, capture this information in a shorter period of time and also spend more time in understanding and evaluating these things. So this. Uh, suddenly opened up a new arena for us and a new details of understanding of it. And also, uh, uh, I mean, in a disaster mitigation kind of scenario, if something happens to this building, we have much more accurate information to restore it, reinterpret it and uh, assess it in a much, much better way than a, a two dimensional approach. I've seen many of the such kind of a, uh, uh, temple. this is another temple which we did in a place called Taranga. A uh, very remote place in uh, um, uh, Gujarat and uh, Rajasthan's border. So such kind of a uh, remote areas, if I really have to do it manually, one is that it would have been impossible. Second thing, with the time that we have done it and the accuracy that we were expecting, it just wouldn't have been possible. So with the uh, uh, combining this lidar and uh, uh, drone-based photogrammetry, uh, aerial photogrammetry or drone photogrammetry, we started using it extensively and you know getting a little more detailed insight into it. And uh, perhaps, of course, the scales also became a little bit more. We started looking at a much bigger scales like Varnas's guards and other things. Now, for example, this is something a, a very, very vibrant, uh, you know, uh, you know, entity like Varanasi. It would have been impossible uh, to actually document it in a, a thing like, you know, I mean, because this has got at some point of time lots of people gathering there, so much of movement of this thing, and at the most with the uh, available technologies like your pedestal mapping uh, or certain kind of a, you know, perhaps uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? your. Um, Total station, you, you won't be able to take so many measurements, perhaps. You know, so, whereas here you have acquired the data completely in a you know a three-dimensional approach. Uh, you know, approach. Now, uh, it initially it was very difficult for us to explain our to our uh, you know, people that they thought this is something like a very uh, you know some sort of a video or a photograph or a you know somewhere in between that. The kind of applications of this data they were not understanding it. So they were. Half the time, they were asking us to produce them, convert them to two-dimensional line drawings. And in fact, if I show you this line drawing, it looks like a very pretty one. But here I know why this wall has collapsed, why this particular area is damp, why this, uh, you know, I mean, where the slopes are going, you know, what is really happening with all those kind of things would have been much more easier. And the information is also, you know, a sort of a geotagged information. It's like, you know, I mean, I know any, you know, I mean, uh, level of information from the uh, you know micro level of information to even to uh, assess uh, uh, every point and location take it into you know uh, I mean your uh, GA systems also you can integrate that areas and then uh, each each of this uh, element we know where are these geotag you know with the north thing X Y Z locations are you know or uh, the area uh, very realistically taking out how much of an area we can really, you know, uh, for certain purposes. Suppose if you want to restore that area, how much of this uh, space is required, all those kind of a complex areas we could really generate and capture it. Now, at a micro level, of course, 
the these data are not just only meant for you know certain kind of visualization purpose one is an architectural understanding condition assessment of it maybe you know mitigation part of it in terms of a thing whether it's because you know we can really calculate how much is the capacity of the place when one lakh people visit it or something at a micro level well uh, uh, very very important site like sanati which i was i was working on you know uh, one of this uh, uh, very famous uh, ashoka's uh, uh, panel is there in fact uh, uh, by, while trying to restore it these guys have driven some stainless steel pins inside now today if you try to lift this panel it will break it into you know, 100 pieces it's virtually it's just lying on the floor nobody can has got to lift it up because in the name of restoration they have completely destroyed it because they have not understood this limestone limestone is a sedimentary stone if you try to drive it you know stitch it with the bolt it will further uh, split it so these kind of a things like you know when i am only with a very high level of uh, accuracy of using uh, three dimensional data so the white light scanning we could get it and then for a posterity sake uh, we have the detailed information even the sculpture you know if it gets damaged we could recreate it using a you know i mean some sort of a robotic arm you know i mean uh, using for a milling purposes so uh, that's a, that's a kind of a, a, a thing that we could really use it you know similar kind of a stone if um, you know maybe some 10 ton stone using a seven axis robotic arm we could uh, mill it in a sense like you, you can say that why can't we make it as a you know manually sculpture it it's impossible to uh, it is forbidden to do in archaeology to re replicate any kind of a thing which are you know uh, ethically because a uh, new sculpture can never be the same as the old sculpture because it has got uh, the you know the the stamp of a time it has those things but at least now since we're using this kind of a uh, you know, technique it's as good as a photocopy so there's no human intervention in it so there is a, a authenticity of information uh, authenticity of uh, material can be you know i mean uh, looked at now well um, i mean why we really need to document because this is what is going to happen to most of our you know historic buildings in the name of restorations, in the name of modernization, people are going to erase this information. So, I mean, or, you know, they really do not understand the genre. This is what they end up in terms of making as a, you know, as a, as a, uh, you know, very brutal uh, restoration. The intentions may be good to restore it, but then, you know, this is what is happening with these kind of structures. So, I mean, this, I would say this is something which is important to do very detailed investigation, documentation, the rich heritage that you are looking at is at least thousand years old. These are all 9th, 10th century works of, uh, you know, uh, thing. Uh, thousand years, these buildings have stood, but today somebody is brutally changing them, assaulting them with the, you know, with a very innocent intention of uh, sort of uh, developing them. So we need to really look at these kind of uh, things very carefully. And then, and uh, whether it's a disaster man-made like this or a natural, at least for the posterity sake, we have the data because we have not completely understood it. So this is with that one few words, I will, you know, uh, stop my talk. We can uh, hope it might be. Uh, hope I did not rush it fast. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a comprehensive run through, uh, not just in terms of understanding the disaster to documentation, but also the technology that we have been through, gone through in the last 20, 25 years. Uh, in terms of the kind of outputs that you show, uh, what we have is a very sophisticated tool currently. Like uh, uh, there are a lot of open source softwares. Everyone has a camera. There's no not a problem that we need to tell people like, oh, please carry your camera. You can even build a 3D model with your phone cameras now. So uh, with the kind of that increase in calibration, I think the num the, the detail it has has kind of enormously increased. Uh, we can't even say it's multiplied. It's actually gone to another shift i think we have moved to another uh, era of uh, digital data that, yes. that is possible in front of us sir. So all this one i would say that you know this we did not import from outside the most of the trials techniques you know i mean from the you know whatever that open source is that available tweaking them at times with little bit of a uh, you know <laughs> plugin and learning from the mistakes maybe you have we have failed Hundred times before we achieved one, you know, uh, reasonably good, uh, uh, you know, result. Yeah. So I, um, I mean, 
I, I can tell you that, you know, I started at a very late age, you know, in fact, I'm getting into this thing, but it was not difficult for us to, you know, I mean, for all the things there is, you, you have open source uh, forums or some sort of a thing, yeah. ask questions, did not go for any training or kind of thing. Most of the things started from the scratch, but the domain understand the knowledge helped us a lot. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. That's actually a contextualization of tools. Uh, when you understand the tool and when you understand the space, I think we, the, I think trial and error method has been the way. I, I think that we can clearly see you have you have discovered the wheel, uh, you have kept it running, you have repaired it, you have checked it back again, but ensured that the data that comes out, uh, the reliability of the data comes out is kind of improved every point at every every level and every addition of a tool that has come with user. So that that's. Uh, I'm really honored to have been through the uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, I think the questions we'll any is end up taking up after the next presentation. Um, now I think, uh, 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 okay, if Sonam is ready, so you can call Sonam, Sonam Gupta. Sonam, are you there? Hi, uh, good morning. Yeah, so Sonam is with us. Uh, she's our uh, next speaker. Uh, she's an architect uh, with close to a decade of experience, and uh, she currently has her own uh, uh, opening, uh, uh, own firm uh, that's called uh, Andar Bahar, and uh, she has been uh, mentoring students uh, in architectural institutions. She has been working on research-based design studios with uh, many universities and across uh, government bodies, and she has also published a lot of architectural preparation uh, materials. So, uh, up to you, Sonam. I'm looking forward to uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, uh, it's uh, been an absolute honor listening to Dr. Rao. Thank you so much. And in fact, I'd uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, CARE and NITM and uh, sort of initiating the dialogue uh, towards uh, uh, cultural uh, heritage, understanding the significance of cultural heritage, and then uh, paving way for the, uh, or at least creating the awareness uh, uh, towards 3D documentation that is required for these uh, cultural heritage uh, built as well as uh, unbuilt uh, components. So um, thank you. And uh, then thanks for letting me uh, share my views on this. Um, I'll uh, start the presentation. If you can just grant me the sharing rights. My screen visible? Yes, yes, you have a screen. Okay. So uh, we've already established that we're going to be talking about 3D cultural heritage documentation and how it can augment uh, the disaster management. Uh, however, I want to talk about uh, as interesting as uh, uh, the talk uh, given by Dr. Rao has been very very insightful in fact uh, as a student i remember even up to uh, the point where i was teaching uh, architecture students uh, uh, each time that we have to talk about uh, temple architecture or the understanding of it we've had to rely on uh, uh, books written by foreigners even if they've been experts like dr rao uh, quoted uh, professor adam had Adam Hardy in uh, his presentation. We've, we've had to rely on uh, those kind of books. But uh, like, like uh, uh, Rajendran, Professor Rajendran mentioned at the opening, at the onset of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, globally, uh, there is a lot of gap in where, where the world is and where um, even if we are a developing country, where we are um, and it is uh, at this point it's it's almost at the the world is at the stage where they're looking at um, 
city is um, as a as the entire repository of uh, these cultural heritage because it's as important as the built heritage is the context that they are situated in also is of just as much value as architects and as designers we talk of um, build and the components and uh, uh, the the parametric uh, aspects of uh, uh, intricate and uh, complicated structures uh, trying to uh, unveil understand and perhaps i mean recreating the kind of 3d printed model that dr rao has shown is just beyond awesome uh, even the urban landscapes uh, uh, i can't imagine the kind of point data cloud that must have gone into uh, the creation of varanasi ghats uh, as as a entire precinct but uh, um, all architects, all designers definitely do uh, talk about all the other aspects also, um, the social aspects, the political aspects. Uh, like Sir mentioned, uh, the time obviously is a very, very uh, key component. Uh, and all of these layers also cannot be ignored. The documentation process, to a certain extent, must uh, must at least at some level start um, addressing uh, these aspects if not really i mean documentation probably is not really possible possible in the stricter sense but then looking at cities and if you are uh, one if if we uh, think of if we are uh, going one step beyond the uh, urban landscapes and urban uh, precincts and think of documenting cities we can perhaps uh, start incorporating these other, so to say, intangible layers. And I mean, um, at the global and international level, UNESCO also now uh, has this World Heritage Con uh, Convention, wherein uh, almost, um, just a second. Wherein we've, uh, uh, UNESCO has marked almost uh, 300 World Heritage Sites, uh, cities. Um, and they're almost, uh, when it comes to um, sites, the cultural sites, almost 1,200 uh, that UNESCO has here marked. And uh, of these, uh, perhaps 180, 185 um, sites are in uh, Asia. Uh, now, very quickly, I just want to uh, reiterate, even if redundant, I just want to quickly go through what the understanding of what cultural heritage is. Uh, we look at monuments, those are architectural works, uh, cultures, uh, uh, inscriptions, which can be uh, historic in nature, which can be art, which could be to a certain extent scientific. Uh, then we have groups of buildings. Uh, which are um, connected, interconnected buildings. Uh, and at this point, we have a certain layer of the uh, uh, the sense of place, uh, the connections that uh, these have, uh, beyond which we have sites like Dr. Rao uh, discussed. But then what about uh, the urban settlements or the cities? Uh, are we really talking about those? Now, um, since we established that uh, it's uh, high time that we move, that we start looking at the other layers also, um, uh, Hull, uh, as promoted by UNESCO again, um, heritage, urban landscapes, and then beyond that, heritage cities. Um, so these uh, integrate uh, cultural heritage and settlements, which uh, cultural uh, heritage and cities and settlements with policies and practices for sustainable urban development. Uh, 
the whole uh, idea of the whole notion over here is in case uh, we're able to document these in intangible or the other layers associated with the built component, we might uh, uh, be able to come up with policies and practices uh, which can then uh, further augment the sustainable development goals that we have. Um, uh, the uh, Hull and Heritage City uh, program of UNESCO basically advocates uh, landscape as an approach for identifying, conserving, managing historic areas uh, within the broader uh, context, considering the interrelationship between the physical forms of course, here now we have uh, we're going one step beyond physical forms. That is the natural features, the social and cultural values. Also, uh, we are incorporating over here. Um, Hal also recommends uh, that there are additional tools uh, to integrate policies and practices of conservation of the built environment into the wider goals of urban development in respect of the inherited values and traditions of different cultural contexts. So it's it's basically saying the same thing. Uh, in case um, uh, of the uh, urban pressing that has been documented, if we are able, that, that sort of gives us a sense of the place that most architects and most designers talk of. Uh, it's it, it enables us to um, get a glimpse into the uh, social and cultural um, aspects of what the place might be or the other attributes uh, that perhaps had led to the formation of the structure or of the uh, place in general. Now the challenges that historical cities Space, such as uh, water, climate change, uh, management, the heritage economics, or the uh, even in uh, some cases, for instance, uh, the town of Maheshwari, it, it's not just the fort, it is also uh, uh, the uh, weaving practice, practices that, uh, that become a part of. Uh, the identity and image of the city or or, or of that precinct because uh, it's it's ultimately in the port or its vicinity that uh, uh, the weavers are housed now um uh, if we think uh, about the heritage urban heritage uh, and come up with ways to uh, reimagine these, we can perhaps take a step forward in the recovery and in, in making these places a little more resilient. Uh, and, and the basic or the first most step towards that would be sensitization and awareness creation towards all of this. Um, now, we've already seen that we have about uh, 300 world uh, 300 world heritage uh, sites or 300 uh, historic cities of the total of uh, 1200 uh, UNESCO uh, identified uh, heritage sites. Um, we have about 40 sites uh, in India, whereas we only have two uh, heritage cities. And at the world level, uh, we have about 300 world heritage cities. Ahmedabad has been the first one and the next one has been Jaipur. Also, there is this third site, which is, uh, which is the recent most uh, heritage site identified in India by UNESCO, uh, which is the site of the Halavira. This can be looked upon as uh, a modern archeological site. But then this can uh, also be looked upon as a uh, Harpan city. Uh, this is uh, a proto Bronze Age period uh, uh, site, like we know. Uh, but this is also one of the key cities of uh, the Indus Valley civilization. Uh, the professionals in the construction industry definitely would be aware. Even the planners would be aware that the drainage system or other aspects of 
the Indus Valley civilization and those cities so many years back, back as in the uh, proto uh, Bronze Age, even before the uh, documentation of Bronze Age really started, uh, we had, even in India, we had cities but in the drainage system or the organization or the hierarchy was so intricate. This is, I mean, documentation of the whole thing uh, at a 3D level obviously is is required. But like uh, Professor Rajendran said, uh, where where are we? If you were to uh, understand uh, uh, where we are um, i think uh, it is also important to understand the uh, stakeholders here stakeholders uh, be public sector private sector or the users public sector um, we all know uh, local government the central government the municipalities uh, uh, the various departments um, globally we have a lot of universities also uh, even here, we uh, we would need the support of uh, university experts, even universities. But uh, then, uh, it it probably the way forward is more of a public-private partnership in a way. Uh, entrepreneurs, cultural institutions, the NGOs, or uh, independent professionals, like uh, Professor mentioned. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the users who are local residents and tourists. Uh, all of these stakeholders become critical because each one would tend to view or tend to uh, have a different perspective, would bring something additional onto the table, either in terms of creating awareness or in terms of uh, uh, augmenting the policies that are required uh, for us to sort of protect uh, and even before protecting, documenting uh, uh, our heritage. I've tried to look at uh, some of the uh, uh, tangible uh, components that can go beyond the, um, uh, the obvious built heritage that we've been talking about. A geospatial data, if we were to uh, add things, the built heritage is as is complex. Uh, and if we were to think of adding uh, the geospatial uh, layers, the layers of uh, topological information, the bu building height or the tree cover, uh, the tree cover, uh, I mean, at this is this point, uh, we when we uh, talk of uh, SDG or smart cities, all of these things or climate change, all of these things become important. And when, when we are talking of uh, two-dimensional documentation. Um, it is a, this one of the things as simple as uh, a 2D drawing, uh, not being able to give us clarity about um, the actual tree cover versus the overall vegetation. Now, when we talk of 3D documentation, we uh, we might have a. a, a access to uh, open access LIDAR, photogrammetry, uh, uh, and other softwares. We are making uh, use of it. Parametric is one thing that uh, we are uh, advancing in unprecedentedly. But uh, globally, uh, there, are, uh, there are means to uh, understand uh, what is actually a tree and what is actually, so, what they're doing is um, the MIT lab, for instance, what they're doing is uh, they are uh, from the uh, street view, uh, they're imagining how tall uh, the tree cover is in respect to the elevation of uh, buildings. Now, urban furniture, uh, we might think of it as a very, very trivial aspect, but it is not. Uh, for instance, if we look at uh, some of the colonial cities, um, in, in the moment you walk through the vistas or the avenues, it is, even before uh, we look at a, a building really, 
the signages or the bandstands or the bus stops or the benches or uh, uh, the brackets that support the buildings. Uh, those kind of things are very telltale of the period uh, that uh, they that specific uh, building, the specific uh, city or the specific precinct was had come up in. Uh, if we talk of cantonments, for instance, um, just a, a, a very basic glimpse at a lot of these urban furniture can can reveal a lot about when it must have been conceived, what might have been going through that time. So the documentation of all of this is also just as critical. Now, um, built heritage, of course, is there, but then the access, the approach areas, all of that also needs to be documented. And if we were to document all of this, this can go a long way in uh, uh, contributing to disaster relief, uh, augmenting the uh, disaster mitigation uh, policies. And uh, at the same time, uh, again, referring to Dr. Rao's presentation, the uh, urban ground, uh, underground or the subterranean built structures that we have, we can go beyond these also and understand uh, like a lot of panel structures, uh, um, our armed forces have dug out and documented a lot of these, which actually has given us a lot of insight into uh, what those forts or what their defense system or what their uh, security system probably was like. And if we were to uh, document all of this, plus have the layer of uh, underground water network, we can perhaps, uh, I'm sorry, um, um understanding uh, cities like udaipur and the entire network of uh, lakes uh, can can that that documentation can further be used to explore and learn further to um, preserve the natural resources even today take it one step further and of course when while we're documenting all of these uh, subtle tangible layers we are also at some level uh, we, are, we start recording the intangible layers that that are a huge component of place making the social organization obviously the economic systems that were there uh, for instance in dolabira uh, or the the trade systems or how prosper they were can 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 be at least uh, imagined if we are able to imagine or get a sense of this while we are documenting 2D, if we can uh, document 3D, uh, the kind of learning or the kind of uh, even simulations that we will be able to generate would be enormous. Then the uh, language, literature, art, all of that uh, can, I mean, we can get a step closer to understanding all of those if we are recording all of these tangibles. Uh, religion, customs, uh, religion, uh, again, uh, Dr. Rao's presentation, uh, the, the case of Varanasi, or uh, 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 like Dr. Amita Sinha talks of, um, a lot of the other dhats can be, or the religious corridors, we can, we can document a lot of those. In fact, uh, the forms of governance uh, could probably be looked into uh, in uh, countries like Italy or Spain, or even in um, our context, um, some of the uh, colonial settlements, uh, whether or not there had been some level of dual governance, maybe we, we could guesstimate at least. Now here I'm just, um, in, a, in a brief, I'm trying to look at uh, some key uh, benefits that, that can be derived out of pre documentation with regards to the disaster uh, risk reduction. We can also, uh, if we're able to uh, 3D document uh, the heritage cities, we can probably have um, a comparative analysis of built environments across geographies and even across time periods. We can have enhanced explora explorations and learnings because um, uh, we will we'll be able to, if not reproduce, uh, we'll, we'll be able to um, have real time virtual urban uh, simulations uh, we can have. Uh, then uh, uh, 
uh, revitalizing cultural spaces, of course, uh, revitalizing or restoring just the built heritage is one aspect, but uh, the context in which they were functioning is has, I mean, that has to be important. And if we're able to document the entire city is we'll be able to uh, restore and revitalize the entire uh, cultural presence and context uh, in which uh, these built heritage uh, uh, thrive. Uh, identifying the spaces uh, uh, in the city, uh, these can actually give us a lot of uh, uh, preparedness uh, uh, disaster preparedness. These, I mean, the response, uh, the disaster, post disaster responses that we have can perhaps then be improved because uh, a lot of times uh, the, the possibility of a relief area just goes amiss because we don't have, uh, uh, I mean, the architects would understand uh, even the uh, negative spaces in, uh, say, the no lease diagram or the 2D drawings, the cities, the way that cities should be documented are the built heritage as is, is anyway so complex and when it comes to documenting or representing the cities it's it's a bigger complication then awareness creation um uh, can um uh, 3d documentation can help us uh, in creating awareness and dissemination of the entire information for instance if um a certain restoration were to happen in a certain area and that is uh, occupied by uh, this this i think happens in most of the cases if if we were to uh, 3d document just like when um, we have uh, 3d simulation tools uh, to present a certain design that um, uh, that a professional is conceived conveying that becomes easier in my understanding, uh, 3D documentation of the uh, existing structure, existing precincts, and the existing regions would also help uh, uh, bodies that intend to restore intact, for instance, or bodies that intend to uh, prepare uh, those areas for disaster relief, uh, like NIDM. Uh, in the awareness, uh, that can be transferred to uh, the stakeholders or the community that are still uh, using those areas can be enhanced much, much more. I've just gotten into the details of each point over here. Uh, if we identify these buffers, uh, like discussed, uh, the various layers, uh, like so also mentioned, Dr. also mentioned, uh, even with built heritage, there are uh, so many layers and uh, bringing together 3D uh, sort of removes the uh, redundancies, removes the discrepancies. And uh, in, in this sort of case, if we were to bring together the uh, uh, geological layer or the uh, terrain data, we can perhaps even predict uh, which uh, specific cultural or which specific built heritage areas need to be addressed or need to be taken care of first. Um, and then the other rehabilitation policies can also be uh, thought of better. Comparative analysis, again, uh, if we can um, document the entire cities, uh, of course, we might not have that here, but globally we have that. Virtual urban environments are recreated and those people are exploring and learning a lot from the urban past. The entire process of city evolution also can be understood so much better. Um, and uh, this we've already uh, talked of, but then uh, we know UN and, and uh, it's the other uh, uh, global uh, organizations are laying so much emphasis on uh, uh, the landscape and the uh, city uh, conservation documentation as well, because uh, um, there are layers that uh, actually lead to the sustenance, lead to the thriving of 
or lead to that built heritage becoming uh, perhaps what it is today. Uh, there, there are layers, there are urban layers that add to the significance of the built heritage itself. Those need to be documented as well. Awareness creation, of course, uh, other than uh, being able to come up with better policies, uh, other than being able to uh, restore the possibility of being able to restore built heritage better, uh, we can also uh, have community part. The community participation in this case becomes much, much easier. We have some cases in um, China. Uh, there, of course, everything's uh, a lot more community centric. But uh, the challenges that we face over here uh, while uh, trying to restore some of the built heritage areas or trying to uh, revitalize those uh, areas. Uh, if we were to 3D document the whole dissemination of uh, the intention, probably would ease out. Uh, then uh, the uh, uh, the climate change uh, aspects can also be interwoven. Uh, over here alongside built heritage that would not only protect the built heritage a lot more but also help us move towards SDG, the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, okay, uh, now very quickly, I've, uh, uh, we, we understand all of this is important, but uh, at this time, I obviously press towards um, the need for open access um, to and uh, toolkits with a, a lot easier user interface. Uh, we know that uh, the understanding of uh, uh, this, the spatial components uh, has been very, um, the design fraternity has been very introverted, but when it comes to conservation of our heritage when it comes to uh, the uh, policy formation for disaster relief, this, this has to open out. And the uh, user interface of all of the, those tools, um, the, uh, the access to database has to be much more open. And I've just uh, compiled some uh, points, some examples of how the global worlds uh, just even if they are uh, startups uh, the global startups uh, are thinking of this as more of a csr and uh, their documentation and even the tools are uh, thrown open to public thrown open to almost everyone um, a lot of them are in italy uh, some of them uh, are obviously in usa and canada but um, there is also RGS, of course, is there. Uh, however, there is this uh, reality captures a small software which is partially regulated, uh, developed by uh, a startup, uh, uh, which is an integrated effort uh, between Czech and Slovakia. Um, so they they have this uh, software which is is partly open to use um, and there is uh, this this tool has been used uh, by the university of cape town to actually document uh, a, a, a heritage precinct in sri lanka uh, i'd love to play this uh, one small video which will actually give us uh, the details Just a second. My screen, I hope, still visible. 
right now. Okay. So uh, the last uh, open access tool or partially open access tool, uh, Reality Capture, which uh, is a Czech and Slovakia initiative. And now the University of Cape Town has uh, used their tool to document uh, a heritage precinct. And the other additional layers that they've uh, captured is phenomenal. It's not really my work, it's their work, but got access to it. I'd love to share it with everyone. So my point in showing that video has just been, uh, it's not a mere video, it's its uh, a 3D documentation. Uh, if you were to look at, uh, not mention the link of your, uh, but it's there available on the internet. Uh, they have each and every uh, fan section of uh, uh, of that place. Uh, but, but then also they've been able to capture the intangibles uh, the tree canopy, the distances, or uh, the the sense of place that we uh, keep talking of. I mean, th this that's that's the layer. That's one and two is uh, in spite of the fact that the software was developed uh, uh, by uh, uh, a Czech team, Czech 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 and Slovakian team. It has been if the interface and the ease and the access is it has been given uh, and is globally provided. And the same thing has been used by a university of a different region altogether. Uh, 
to document the heritage site which is uh, in a completely different uh, geographical region that is i'm just wanting to stress over here is um, on the fact that the uh, access and the interface the ease of interface and the ease of access is very very critical in uh, taking all of this forward and even if we don't have such toolkits for developed over here we can always refer to the ones uh, that are globally available and perhaps uh, think of adding this uh, or and documenting even the um, the subjective layer that that give us this whole new dimension of actually revealing the cultural significance of a certain place um, that's that's all i would want to say over here and again thank you for giving me the opportunity to share all of this thank you thank you thank you so uh, i think from a detailed contextualized point it was good to look at uh, the overall policies and the requirements and the current uh, uh, state of uh, the cultural heritage and the cities and all so thank you for your presentation we'll just have a quick present a uh, quick talk from uh, mr architect ramalingam uh, who's the uh, the keynote speaker for the thing he joined a little later so he has uh, he has a wealth of experience behind him. He has been in the teaching field and practicing for the last 35 years, starting as a teaching assistant in 1980s in NIT Trichy. He also he started architecture department in Madurai, uh, and currently he's working with Care School of Architecture as a design chair. And he has been involved in a lot of hands-on, uh, vernacular, traditional. Uh, different kinds of architectural practices and he's been mentoring a whole lot of people in this part of uh, the country. Uh, I'd like to thank for him being present also. Uh, Ramalingam sir, please uh, do work. Yeah. Uh, thank you Mani Arasan for uh, a bit uh, introduction of myself to the audience and thanks for the opportunity here. Um, it is, a, it is an opportunity for me to listen to a fantastic uh, presentation by uh, both uh, Professor Rao and Sonam here. You know, uh, it is a, a great experience and great learning for me also. But here, uh, I like to recollect uh, when I say disaster, it, the major disaster which we have come across is that uh, 2004 uh, that tsunami. Right. So soon after that, uh, after the two, three days, uh, I, I happened to go there for some relief activities. So then one of the worst hit area near Elankani, uh, the east coast of Tamil Nadu. I went to a village, which is one of the uh, very badly hit uh, village, uh, Bishaman village. I just walked across and uh, I could see the water level uh, maintained for three, four days in that area, in the settlements. And then I just walked up to the beach. I was just uh, going down by the uh, the beach. I never realized, okay, the water had come and it has gone. That's it. But then after a, 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 a brief walk of over 10 minutes, I came across, there was a hand pump, water hand pump, I mean, a shallow borewell hand pump. But it was at a height of about uh, 3 to 3.5 meters above my I was standing here on the floor and the pump, the, 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 the hand pump was there at that level. Uh, I mean, I was just looking at it uh, surprisingly. Then I came to realize that earlier to the tsunami, the, the ground level or the sand level was at that height. But then after the tsunami, the ground level, the surface level has really gone down by 3 to 3.5 meters, you know. But for that uh, shallow borewell and the hand pump, I wouldn't have understood or realized the level of the earlier ground uh, the surface level and the current surface level. You know, I took a photograph. I'm sorry, I, I was trying to uh, locate the photograph for some time. It was not available here. So this kind of three-dimensional objects 
helped us to realize the situation prior to the disaster and the situation after the disaster. You know, but uh, after uh, listening to what Professor Rao was talking and uh, Sonam was, uh, you know, deliberating, I think uh, earlier all these documentations were word of mouth and then some scripts later with 2D drawings, which left to the uh, audience or those readers later lots of assumption. But here with the technology, with the 3D technology, which is being very widely used for uh, a heritage document, I think uh, uh, nothing could be left, you know, without uh, clearly being understood, be it clearly being explained as well as understood. You know, no stone is, or very, very less stone is unturned in this kind of uh, document. The technology has really come up. And uh, I think with the kind of uh, documentation which uh, was Rao was showing and uh, uh, Sonam was explaining otherwise, we can really create, uh, you know, a kind of a, a 3D um, picture images or whatever it is which will clearly tell the people okay this is it apart from the awareness you know whenever you talk about disaster it is it was earlier disaster relief then mitigation then restoration but now we started thinking about resilience you know prevention is better than cure so why don't we make some resilient uh, situation? You know, whatever the technology has been discussed now, it is on the heritage uh, sites, heritage building, and heritage cities. But this could be also very, very useful to sensitize the people, sensitize the stakeholders. You know, when I say stakeholders, it's the public, it's the policy makers, the administrators, the politicians. All these people could be really sensitized about you know, the possibilities of the disaster, man-made or uh, natural, you know, by creating uh, VR or AR uh, technique with the help of your 3D documentation, you know, we can really create a situation of disaster virtually and make people or the stakeholders to understand, sens get sensitized about the situation, the worst situation possible and take, you know, pre preventive or resilient steps ahead. When they are doing their policy making and things, you know, I'm talking like what uh, Sonam was talking the a, a larger level of uh, urban settlements and other things. You know, uh, the, now the recent disaster, the natural disaster, the Turkey disaster, uh, the the death claim is uh, more than uh, twenty eight thousand according to the newspaper today. But now they realize that a particular stretch of pieces, I mean land, the buildings have collapsed because it is almost close to the uh, you know, joint of two, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, uh, land plates actually. So, but that area could have been prevented with the kind of development we said. Now they are arresting. Today's news, they say they arrested so many fellows who really violated the rules, the developers, the policy makers, everyone. But these things could have been avoided with the help of, you know, some simulations, some uh, VR simulations, whatever it is, with the help of 3D uh, documentation which is being used mostly and widely for the uh, heritage uh, sites, heritage building and heritage settlements could have really saved a few thousands of lives apart from the property or whatever it is. I think this technology 3D documentation really helps even the documenter to reach the unreached side of uh, the documentation and it helps the people to really dissipate, understand and get sensitized about, you know, Again, the uh, reaching the not possibly unreachable uh, part of it. So I think uh, this is this is where we are now, and I think uh, it's really very interesting to listen to the presentations and works you've done uh, by Professor uh, Rao and uh, Sonam's uh, um, you know presentation. I think it's going to be uh, very very interesting and very useful, uh, not just for the heritage but also for the people in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your words and some amazing analogies, as always, it's been pretty subtle in trying to tell us 
uh, uh, more clearly. Yeah. So uh, if we have any questions, uh, we can do. Do they type it or do they be will they be able to ask? They can write down, but if they want okay. to ask, they can. They can okay. just raise their hands. So any participants, if they want to ask any questions. And then I, I would like to just have a, a small question with uh, Professor Rav sir. So, because it, it's not that we are lacking the tools, but then actually as cultural heritage sector, we are certainly not equipped. Like if you are looking at uh, laser scanners and the companies that are doing 3D documentation, there are many in India currently. But then, and then they are offering services to conservation and heritage sectors or disaster management and all. But then there is always a gap that as, as a technologist who is trying to give you 3D data and as a conservator who's trying to read that. And, and every time there is a gap in terms of the, the skill, uh, the tools that we have, like we may not have the what do you say? If if we are making a movie, we are gonna get it in a MOV file. But if you are doing it in a three, and and then every every computer is gonna play that. But if you are gonna have uh, a 3D data of of a certain cultural heritage assert, where where are we going to actually close that uh, uh, gap, or or is it is it possible to close the gap? Uh, the gap will be there always. Uh, that the the, the the race between hardware and software will never end unless until where we should know what we want. Now, the, the, uh, virtually we started this uh, uh, photogrammetry. You saw that very, very rudimentary one, most probably some 6,000 um, uh, polygonal mesh to now. I would say that, you know, I mean, one the same size, I have 6 million, 60 million is not ending, you know, the, I mean, initially there was this enthusiasm of uh, trying to do everything in a very high resolution. Now that now I realize that you know I have different approaches for different applications. The question comes for what I'm using for. Now, uh, uh, in fact, this all this reality capture did not start with the heritage. And we are we started using it. It was started by the reverse engineering guys. Technically started from the you know somebody makes a design one day you know or a, in a car or a model or a, a engine and then uh, some fellows used to buy one model scan it and make a hundred out of it so it all started by the reverse engineering guys but then we have found it as an application because uh, it is useful for us to acquire the information at a accurate and faster and uh, different way. Now, when we use this uh, uh, for different application, one was for 3D reconstruction, perhaps maybe I require only very little data. But the, with the domain knowledge, I can reconstruct it. If I want it for restoration purpose at a very, you know, uh, very high accuracy, uh, like what we saw, saw the Ashoka's uh, statue, you know, I mean, which is uh, uh, to be milled, then the different kind of resolution is required. Or it was only for certain kind of a, a 3D reconstruction, re, 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 I think then some other kind of an approach is there. So we should know what our domain applications are. There are applications, you know, uh, you, have, you will get a range of things like uh, uh, right from the very low um, um, uh, uh, resolution ones to very high level resolution. From a city level, like you know, for example, recently finished uh, two major uh, uh, temple towns. Uh, one is uh, Sri Sailam and uh, Kalahasti. The whole city had to be mapped, and then of course another one star project we did with our students for uh, this place, uh, Warangal. You know, almost we were covering, uh, you know, how I many 800, 900 acres of uh, uh, area, built area, very richly, uh, densely built area. So such kind of thing. So then you have to play with that little different different resolutions for different different applications. Now I think you know when I ask for a system, I you know uh, 
some of our uh, administrators were wondering one one small department which is dealing with the age old heritage you know khandar buildings these guys are asking for a supercomputer i mean the kind of configuration they were asking for is they were wondering like you know who is asking these things and there is some one fellow who is working on some all old buildings is asking for a system which is costing 15 lakh rupees or 16 lakh rupees so um, then i said that the question is that you know where do we put this uh, thing where do we put it at so the domain knowledge is important in my opinion uh this gap is going to be there and uh, well that gap is required because unless there is no gap we will not have hunger <laughs> we need to have that you know um, you know we need to be hungry <laughs> to you know uh, attain you know rise the bar go to the next level so that that gap is important i would say let's not close that gap yeah because in indian context we are like uh, even if we are able to give one ortho photograph of an elevation people are very happy they are It, it's almost like we are seeing something new out of the world, and and I, I'd be happy to see that these three D walkthroughs are like okay, a normal thing. So I, I I can actually see the three D for condition assessment to understand the structural stability and do all the things. I I really like to see. I think that is a point where the digital heritage part can actually become a seamless uh, uh, sector in cultural heritage. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, for example, even when uh, I got a little grant, uh, that time we projected something like a twelve uh, temples that we will can uh, do that one. We had six months of time. Then, then uh, when when we got the equipment, um, we became very greedy. We <laughs> we finished more than two fifty temples because what we realize that you know we have a domain idea, we know how to survey, we know what we are looking for. So then 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 you will have a, a, a you know. Um, use the tool for a different approach altogether. In and earlier we gave a service provider that fellow will you know, say, you know very uh, mechanically will do uh, okay this many location this one and do it and he will take whole day for one one building or maybe two days for one building. But then we started using some nearby areas fifteen sixteen in one day because we you know we said that you told the operator you keep quiet you just give the equipment we know what it what can be done with it then. Go back and then look at uh, the data. Then you learn something. Okay, well, these are the areas we have uh, shadow areas. These are the gaps. Yeah, so, no. so now I think uh, uh, recently we asked for uh, you know 100 TB space in our server. Again, <laughs> we are very very soon we are going to run out of it because every studio that we are running with our students, we are coming with enormous data. So now. This is now start using them, applying them, understanding them, and then applications into various things. So, well, it it has a certain potential. I'm sure we will also break that uh, you know, gap and ask for more support. <laughs> Great, sir. I think yeah. So I I think as much as the 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 data and the equipment and the cost increases in one side, I think we are also having this smaller set of something like. The iPhone 13s that are coming. Yes, are able to yes, scan. yes. Now, now all, all these kids things. are very smart with uh, very, very, very. You know, it's there at their fingertips. You know, it's like how yes, to use yes. it. What for you are using? That question we need to keep asking ourselves. Not for the data. It's good to. It's it's good to have the two ends, two ends of the spectrum. Uh, kind of like I I think in in another five years and ten years the landscape of digital heritage is going to be completely uh, different and uh, uh, unrecognizable. Probably we do not know. So I, I I think I I take this opportunity to end and thank uh, NIDM National Institute of Disaster Management for conducting these uh, training portals and because I do see a lot of things that, that are lined up uh, of where disaster management looking into different other sectors like it's very good that you're looking at in the interdisciplinary point of view you're not restricting this disaster management as okay we are one department and but then instead you are actually widening up your reach. you're looking and reaching out of different dimensional different disciplinary uh, firms and organizations and institutions i really thank uh, nidm for this opportunity and we really hope uh, these webinar can also expand into hands on workshops or even smaller courses where the where the training programs can actually develop the personnel develop a good amount of uh, the mass that can work in in, in digital heritage sectors which can in term in turn help with the management mitigation resilience and protect protection of uh, important assets of the country
so i also thank you uh, thank uh, sonam for uh, accepting and and presenting uh, your your thoughts about it and i thank my college uh, my institution care school of architecture from truchi for uh, also uh, being very openly being ready to be uh, being a part of this uh, webinar i thank uh, 100 odd audiences who have been listening to this uh, i am glad uh, you were able to listen to professor rao's presentation i think that's the most happiest take over for me uh, from this webinar so thank you thank you so much uh, just a second uh, thanks thank you professor rajendra uh, is there some way that i can maybe uh, connect with dr rao uh, especially after he has mentioned the, the temple towns and then that document yes yes just have to type his name <laughs> yeah please I'll, I'll, I'll text you my this thing you know mail id of course i am a i am a full time professor in the school of planning and architecture vijayawada uh, we can certainly teach i mean of course I, I, all the students because uh, we been uh, we started a program in masters in um, architectural conservation it's a three years depart old department uh, with the two years of uh, covid uh, effect <laughs> but then uh, somehow uh, uh, thanks to this digital technologies i could take my students into the middle of uh, those cities these towns just sitting and you know uh, operating here and there were times like i used to ask them to hire a drone and send a patch file from here for you know mapping that area and then it was a quite a different experience altogether it was like you know i mean some of them are thoroughly you know enjoying it and i'm sure we will release some good professionals in this field who could uh, you know uh, come with a uh, heavy duty equipment <laughs> sure thank you sir thank you very much yeah see you thank you yeah i'll leave now yeah thank you very much yeah thank you sir thank you thank you thank you all